Good morning, Newark Church. It's good to gather with everybody this morning. If you're here in person or online, just man, it is a joy to gather together in the presence of God. His Spirit is here, and we're gathered in the name of Jesus Christ. I want to begin this morning uh, just by reading a short passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Paul says, We have the same faithful spirit as what is written in scripture. I had faith and so I spoke. We also have faith and so we also speak. We do this because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will also raise us with Jesus and he will bring us into his presence along with you. That's the good news we get to celebrate this morning. Let's go to God in prayer, and then we'll do some singing. Oh, Father God, we are grateful to gather here in your presence this morning. We're here, Father God, because you've given us new life in Jesus, whom you raised from the dead. And you've filled us with your spirit, God, is a promise of this inheritance that we have. And Father God, I pray this morning that as we sing to you, as we hear your word this morning as we receive the bread and wine that we can glorify you and give you the praise that you and only you deserve. And Father God, I pray that you can encourage us, that we can be strengthened through your spirit to live as followers of Jesus, that we can encourage each other. It's in your son's name that we pray and give you thanks. Amen. Let's do some singing. Okay, let's stand as we praise God together. The Lord reigns, he is a mighty God. The Lord God reigns, the Lord reigns, he is a mighty God. The Lord God reigns. Great is the Lord Almighty, He is Lord, He is God indeed. Great is the Lord Almighty, He is God supreme. Great is the Lord Almighty, He is Lord, He is God indeed. Great is the Lord. Great is the Mighty God, the Lord God reigns. The Lord reigns. He is the mighty God, the Lord God reigns. Great is the Lord Almighty. He is Lord. He is God indeed. Great. 
great is the Lord Almighty, He is God supreme. Great is the Lord Almighty, He is Lord, He is God indeed. Great is the Lord. Great is the Lord. All to Jesus I surrender. All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. I surrender.
grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the waters holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free, there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me. There is another in Joy come every battle. 
that's where you'll be. Let's pray. God, I just thank you and praise you for another day to gather together and stand before you, sit before you, humble ourselves before you, and just fellowship with brothers and sisters, listen to your word being preached. I know I need you so much, God, and there are so many things this week that I did that I know went in complete opposite of what you have for me and what you want for me. And I just praise you for your grace that you have for me and for all of us. And I pray that you would bless Casey as he comes and brings your word. I pray that you would humble us all to hear what you have to say to us. And that you would just refresh us in your spirit this morning, God. In your son's name we pray. Amen. This is the sermon if you want to follow along on there some, okay? <laughs> Amen. All right. Yes, we're going to say a prayer for moms uh, here in just a second, but it is time for Kids Church. If you'd like to go, kiddos, uh, at this time, y'all enjoy that time this morning. Yeah, thanks to Rex. I was, I got hooked in already, thanks, but of course I forgot the clicker, so. Um, let's go ahead and say a prayer uh, for mothers uh, this morning. Bow with me, please. Uh, God, we are so thankful for our moms. Uh, We're thankful for mothers that are here today. And God, certainly one of the things uh, I've learned the most uh, from Tracy uh, over the years of her being a mom is that joys often still have a little sorrow in them, and uh, sorrows can still have some joy in them. And uh, there are many wonderful moments, and there are bittersweet moments, and there is sadness, and we're thankful that you are in the fire with any moms uh, today with whatever they may be going through, and we pray that you would bless each one and comfort their hearts in just the right way, that you'll fill them with hope uh, because the tomb is empty, and we pray that you'll bless uh, our, our message today, and pray that you'll bless this church family, pray that you will bless us this week as we seek to serve you not in the name of any earthly powers, God, but in the name of Jesus, we pray that you'll lead us. Amen. All right, we will be in Matthew chapter 3, if you have a Bible and want to be turning there. Matthew chapter 3. I did want to mention uh, this podcast that just came out. Uh, If you're a podcaster, Tim Keller is is a big fan of, I'm a big, (laughs) he's a big fan of mine. Yeah, that's wrong. Uh, so, But I'm a big fan of Tim Keller. He does some really thoughtful stuff, and you don't have to agree with everything he says, but in general, he, he's very thoughtful in how he presents Christianity. Now, this is especially for seekers in your life, skeptics in your life, people that aren't going to come here anytime soon, but you might could recommend them check this out. He actually does a Q&A, so he takes questions. It's like at least half the room is are people that are not Christian, who are seeking and they're trying to figure out what their hangups are with Christianity. And, and uh, so it's really helpful. There's only been one week so far, 
but there's going to be a few weeks of it, and I would just encourage you to keep this in mind. It's called Questioning Christianity, uh, and I would encourage you to check that out. Uh, as, as you can see today, and I, my, the uh, easel's not quite what I would, was hoping for with a tall painting, but I got this painting in Haiti uh, a few years ago. I knew I had to have it. I know something about the colors and, of course, the baptism imagery. Uh, so we're using that today. Uh, I always love art. Uh, my uncle is an artist, and, uh, and I am not, so I just bring art because uh, I can't draw art. And uh, so we're really thankful for this image to gather us around this path, uh, passage in Matthew chapter 3 today. But before we get to Matthew chapter 3, I want to start uh, in a little different spot. Have you ever watched a movie or read a book and got to the end of the mo movie or the book and said, there has got to be more to this story? Or said, there better be a sequel, because you knew that the way they left the story, that could not possibly be the end, all right? Well, the Old Testament of our Bibles is like this. Uh, if you're a Bible Project fan like me, the Bible Project actually describes it this way, that the Old Testament is an expertly crafted narrative without an ending. Uh, there is talk of a king who will reign forever. There's talk of a day of judgment or the day of the Lord, which is a, is a reference to justice, where God is going to bring about justice. Uh, that day is mostly to be feared. Uh, but you get to the end of the Old Testament, and none of these things come about. So I want you to see how the Old Testament ends this morning. Malachi chapter 4. Uh, it's, I haven't read it very often, <clears throat> but I read it and thought of this. Read, read along with me here. Surely the day is coming. It will burn like a furnace. All the arrogant and every evildoer will be stubble. And the day that is coming will set them on fire, says the Lord Almighty. Not a root or a branch will be left to them. But for you who revere my name, the sun of righteousness will rise with healing in its rays. And you will go out and frolic like well-fed calves. Then you will go out and, whoops, sorry, uh, then you will trample on the wicked. They will be ashes under the soles of your feet on the day when I act, says the Lord Almighty. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the decrees and laws I gave him at Horeb for all Israel. See, I will send the prophet Elijah to you before that great and dreadful day of the Lord comes. And now read this last verse with me, okay? He will turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the hearts of the children to their parents. Or else I will come and strike the land with total destruction. That is how the Old Testament ends, right? I mean, we're hoping that's not the end of the story, right? Uh, that, that's, a, that's a rough way to end. Uh, so, but I do want you to see this talk about the day, right? And there's this issue with furnace and fire, and there's talk about righteousness. Uh, the day is brought up again there at the end of verse 3. But then there's this strange reference in verse 5, right? I will send the prophet Elijah to you. Now, if you're a good Jew or a good Israelite, you will know that Elijah has already come. <laughs> Why are we talking about Elijah again? And so there is this, uh, this curiosity, this mystery to why, why there would be another Elijah uh, who's going to come. Now, between, between the prophets, and maybe not the prophets so much as you know, the, the Israelites, the Jews coming back in the Ezra and Nehemiah days, there's about 400 years that passes but before John and Jesus come on the scene. And to try and put that in perspective, remember, in four years, the United States will be 250 years old. And you think about everything that's happened, or you think about your American history for a second, everything that's happened in almost 250 years, we'd still have another 150 years to go, another you know, 40-something presidents maybe, before we're going to get to 400 years, before God decides to start really bringing about the end of the story the way he wants it. So it's just amazing the way God works and how slow it seems like God works sometimes. And it is against this backdrop in Malachi chapter 4, and really I'm going to argue this backdrop of fear that Malachi presents, right? The total destruction, the great and dreadful day of the Lord, fire and furnace and all these things. It's against this backdrop that John the Baptist comes on the scene. Now, John had to be a little scary with the way he dressed, 
and the way he preached. And I can't help but think John knew Malachi 4 when he started preaching. So even if you look at Matthew chapter 3, I won't have this on the screen. I'm just going to read a couple verses there at the end of John's little sermon where he says, verse 11, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. John sounds like Malachi, right? He's been reading Malachi here. Three times John talks about repentance. Now, repentance is a fancy word for turning, for changing, right? So when John starts his sermon earlier in chapter 3, he says, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is near. He's saying, turn, turn around, head towards God, because God's here. God's near now. He is here in Jesus. He's preparing the way for Jesus. John says, Repent, for the kingdom is near. He says, Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. I baptize you with water for repentance. John is wanting the people to turn to change. Three times John talks about fire, plus the coming wrath in verse 7. Bad trees will be thrown into the fire. He will baptize with the Holy Spirit in fire, burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Now, if you know the story of old Elijah, there's a great uh, story in 1 Kings 18 uh, where old Elijah says this, and I want you to say this verse with me as well. You ready? Answer me, Lord, answer me, so these people will know that you, Lord, are God, and that you are turning their hearts back again. All right, so here's old Elijah. He's actually fixing to call down fire, and he's asking God to turn hearts. So there's old Elijah. John is living into that idea of Elijah here. Jesus will actually confirm that John the Baptist is Elijah in Matthew chapter 17, if you want to check that out later. So John has become this new Elijah that Malachi talked about. Now John is talking about fire, which except for the baptism that's a purifying fire, the other fires talked about are pretty scary, very fearful. The day of the Lord is meant to be a day where the good people go this way and the bad people go this way. It's a clearinghouse where God separates the good and the bad. It's kind of a scary, scary thought. Even when John talks about a baptism, there is this confession of sins. You know, how, how many of y'all are ready to confess your sins this morning, right? That should sound a little scary if you had to start, you know, lining up to confess your sins. I want, I want you to see here that what John is doing really fits into that mold of fear. And, and it's not all a bad fear. There's, like the fear of the Lord, there is a very healthy awe and respect of God. And, and it's hard not to feel afraid sometimes in the presence of that kind of God, who tells us immediately when we're in that presence, right? He says, don't be afraid. But often our first reaction is fear. So, I think a lot of us grew up with this kind of baptism talk. Fire and fear. One of the ones I heard growing up was, if you were to die today, where would you spend eternity? Oh, man, you talk about a slap in the face, right? You know, buckle up when you get asked that kind of question. Students on campus, uh, they talk about a guy or two on campus, and that one, they call at least one of them Kirkbride Jesus. Jacob, you've seen this guy, right? Uh, Kirkbride Jesus is out there, uh, and he is, he is a John the Baptist kind of guy, all right? Uh, he's a little scary. He's, he's trying to get your attention. He's trying to make you think, uh, don't agree with everything he's saying and doing, but that there are, I understand what he's trying to do. He is in the line of John the Baptist uh, with what he's doing. Anyway, my hunch is that some of us, or most of us, came to Jesus out of fear. And I want you to just think about your experience and think about when you came to Jesus how much fear was associated with that? There was a lot of talk about hell and Jesus returning, but not in the good way, like, man, can't wait until Jesus comes back, but like, oh, I hope Jesus doesn't come back today. We were scared. We didn't want Jesus coming back. It sounded scary to us. 
I remember the preacher preaching to the lost most Sundays. So people that were seekers, people that were not Christian. I grew up with preachers where they were really honed in on the people that were not Christians here on a Sunday morning. Gospel meetings, revivals, if you knew what those were, you'd go Sunday to Wednesday. And even before my time, you'd go all week, sometimes a month. Y'all were crazy back then when y'all did those for so long. There was this focus on the lost and helping people make a decision about Jesus, but a lot of that was wrapped up in fear. It was the John the Baptist sermons. And I think what it did even for the Christians, what it did for the disciples of Jesus is that it ingrained that fear in us even more. Because <laughs> we were the primary ones <laughs> hearing the sermons over and over, right? They were talking to the lost, but we were the ones there listening to the fear. Now, listen carefully, all right? I don't think this approach in general is wrong. People were turning to God because of John's message that had a lot of fear in it. Confession of sin and repentance and a day of judgment are needed and real and true. I just think a baptism of fear is only part of the truth. Maybe we're missing something. It's like getting to the end of the Old Testament and thinking there has to be more to this story. And that's why this morning we're talking about a tale of two baptisms. And so as we go on, John knows that Jesus is about to start his ministry, right? He is preparing the way. He is ready for Jesus to show some shock and awe, to put fire and works together. He is ready for Jesus to clear the floor. He's ready for Jesus to put the bad people over here. He's ready for Jesus to put the good people over here. In other words, John is ready for Jesus to bring in the day of the Lord or the day of judgment. He thinks it's time for Jesus to do that when he shows up. But John is in for a surprise. Jesus comes to the Jordan not to take over John's ministry, not to continue John's preaching. The text says he comes to be baptized by John. Now you talk about a curveball for John. John is confused here. And the text tells us that John tries to stop him. He says, whoa, whoa, Jesus, whoa. This, let, can we turn the mic off for a minute, right? You know, he's like, Jesus, the, what are you doing? This, this is not how this is supposed to go. And he'll, and he'll go on to say, you know, I need to be baptized by you. You don't need to be baptized by me. John did not see this coming. John's job is to prepare the way for Jesus, but apparently he didn't get the whole plan. <laughs> and why, why doesn't John... Uh, he, so John uh, tries to stop Jesus by saying, right, I need to be baptized by you. Why? Why would John say that? Well, John understands baptism to be about confession of sin and repentance. That's what he's been preaching. They are, uh, uh, John understands that he is a sinner and that sinners need to, baptize, need to be baptized, especially in the presence of Jesus. If anybody's going to get baptized, Jesus, it's me. Even a good person like John needs to be baptized. I mean, John's, John's on the straight and narrow. He's doing the work of God, but he still knows he's a sinner. He's not perfect. I like, I like talking about that with students, that even good people need, need to be baptized. Even good people need Jesus, because none of us can stand before a perfect God. So, he knows Jesus doesn't have sin and doesn't need to repent or turn from anything. So why does Jesus want to be baptized? Well, Jesus here is going to give us two cryptic clues, all right? The first one is this little phrase here. He says, let it be so now. The easy to read uh, translation says, let it be this way for now. The N.T. Wright translation says, this is how it's got to be right now. Now, as, as a Bible nerd, I want you to know, I, I, did this part of the, I did this sermon because I was really trying to figure out this, this message, all right? Why, why was Jesus baptized? I have skimmed over this so many times that I never took long enough to realize the emphasis on the word now. 
right? John wants a day of judgment. He's ready for that. And Jesus is saying, no, that's not how it's going to be right now. Right now it's going to look different. So Jesus is really focused on time here and saying, the timing is not right, John, for the day of judgment. And then his second phrase is, it is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. It is proper for us, easy to read, says, we should do whatever God says is right. N.T. Wright says, this is God's good plan to make things right. Righteousness is a big fancy word. It has to do with justice. It has to do with being made right. It has to do with making things right. Everything that has to do with, with being right and made right. And I want you to see here that Jesus is giving us a picture. He, he's trying to say, look at what's happening to me, John. You're still going to be in the, not that the person baptizing is in a real place of power, but I'm not going to be in a place of power. I'm going to be in a place of weakness here. I'm going to submit to you. I'm going to humble myself and let myself be baptized by you. That is not the image that John preached, right? One more powerful than I will come. Well, Jesus, that doesn't really fit the image if you let me baptize you. And so Jesus' baptism is a clue to fulfilling all righteousness. If we read all of Matthew, we know that he is interested in fulfilling things, all right? Matthew quotes the Old Testament more than anybody. Why? Remember how the Old Testament didn't have an ending? Matthew is telling us that God has started writing the ending in Jesus. So now we get to see how this big long story in the Old Testament that didn't have an ending, how it, here's the ending. Here's how it's fulfilled. Here's how the righteousness that all the prophets preached about is going to come about in Jesus. Matthew is telling us that the king we've been waiting on for a long Long time, Israel, is here. He's writing that Jesus is going to show us the end of the story. Well, that still doesn't tell us exactly why Jesus wanted to be baptized. I think Jesus is purposely being mysterious here. Uh, he doesn't want to give away the ending but he does want to give them a preview of the ending. So it's like a little movie trailer, right? You see a few scenes in the movie trailer, and you're like, oh, I wonder if that means that this is going to happen, right? When you just, I mean, you all know, right? These YouTube people, they see a, a movie trailer, and they'll go on about it for an hour just trying to guess what those little short scenes in a, in a movie mean they, because they don't know the whole story yet. Jesus is telling us that the baptism is the trailer, it's the movie trailer. He is fixing to show us what's going to unfold in his life and in his ministry. So in his baptism, he is taking a symbol that already has meaning. John's already given it meaning, right? Confess sins, it's repentance, it's a turning point. Baptism is the pivot point in your life where you've been going away from God and now you're turning towards God. But Jesus is giving it new meaning. So our dear sister Dawn, who I believe is traveling this weekend, um, the, the great article that was written about her, I hope you've had a chance to read it. I hope that uh, this idea where she's turning wedding dresses into burial garments. She, she's taken the, uh, the wedding gowns, right, that already have meaning. They, they were this, this beautiful, special thing for someone, and now they're being repurposed, and they're being given new meanings. The same material, but being used in a different way. That's what Jesus is doing. He's taking baptism and giving it new meaning. Or, or shout out to the moms, if, you, if you've had two of the same, if you've had two girls or two boys, and you've done the thing where you've kept the clothes, right? And the first daughter wore this dress. And if you have a second daughter, and she gets to wear the same dress, it probably takes on a little different meaning, right? It's like, oh, I remember when my, when my oldest wore that dress, and now I get to see another daughter wear that dress. It, it's, it gets filled with new meaning. Well, Jesus takes the turning point of baptism that John gave us and shows us a picture 
of what is going to come and why he wants to be baptized. And so I've got this picture of, of Miles here when he was baptized. It's very cool how he wanted to be baptized as we were transitioning from Mississippi to Delaware. And this was <laughs> after a really long day of U-Haul packing. We had headed to the church building in Oxford, and Miles was baptized. And I wanted you to see this picture because I think it depicts so well what Jesus is trying to tell us here. Going under the water means that he will die. His whole body under the water means he will be buried. But coming up out of the water again means he will rise from the dead. Death, burial, resurrection. Jesus is giving a preview of what is going to happen in his life to bring about the righteousness that God is, is trying to fulfill. So Jesus didn't have to die to sin. That's why John was confused, right? But here's the deal. Jesus still had to die to self. He still had to accept that this is what his father wanted and that he was willing to do it. That he was willing to lay down his life. He was willing to experience death. And he was willing to trust his father to give him life again. And when Jesus does this, when he surrenders all, as we sang this morning, and submits to the ending that his father wants, heaven is opened and poured out on him like a spiritual tsunami. The Spirit of God comes on Jesus in tender beauty like a dove. He will now have the power to do his ministry, and he hears these words, This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased. Father, Son, and Spirit are working together in this beautiful moment. And these statements are huge. Think about this, okay? Before Jesus preaches the Sermon on the Mount, he is loved. Before he heals the paralytic or calms the storm or does anything else, the Father is already pleased with him. He is a son before his ministry ever begins. Jesus already has his identity. So he doesn't have to go out and prove himself to anyone. So Jesus is able to perfectly care for people without caring what they think about him. <laughs> and as a recovering people pleaser, you know, that's, that's really hard to do, right? He cares about people without caring what they think about him. Because he knows that he's a son who is loved, and that his father is pleased with him. So why all this talk about baptism, right? That's a great history lesson, Casey, with a little flourish and fanfare there maybe, but, but why are we talking about this? Well, let me give you a few, few thoughts here at the end. First, it's a little harder for us to understand this after 2,000 years of church history where baptism is sometimes separated from our initial expression of faith. But baptism was seen as part of the beginning of Christian faith and commitment. I love Billy Graham, and you know, I, I've heard some talk about Billy Graham, and, and his, you know, one of the things is when you do big, big uh, stadium things, you're like, well, how are you going to baptize, you know, 10,000 people? You know, it's logistically hard, and we kind of grew up in an evangelical time where, you know, there wasn't maybe practical for a bunch of people to get baptized at once. So anyway, there's a history lesson you can go look into. But anyway, we have experienced that for, for a long time where baptism was separated. And I don't think in the Bible it was separated. Baptism was seen as part of the beginning of Christian faith and commitment. It was lumped in with confession of sin. It was lumped in with repentance. It was lumped in with faith. It all happened about the same time. So when people started following John, they would have pointed to their baptism. I got baptized in the Jordan. When people, point, when people were coming to Jesus, they would have pointed to their baptism in the book of Acts. Why would they have pointed to that? Well, the second thing is something really happens in baptism. Okay, And I love here that N.T. Wright gives, gives us two extremes to try and avoid. All right, One is that we could say that baptism is just magic, 
or that it's just a symbol, all right? Now think about this with me, okay? If baptism is just a symbol, that means God does nothing in baptism, right? You're just going through the motions. It's a nice, it's a nice picture, it's a nice symbol, but God is just on the sidelines doing nothing. But what if it's just magic? If it's magic, then you don't have to do nothing. <laughs> Sorry, a lot of don'ts and nothings there. A little southern boy coming out. Uh, meaning God does everything. Your heart doesn't have to be in a particular place. You basically could just stumble into the baptistry and God's going to do his part, right? Christians do not believe that, okay? We don't believe that baptism is magic. But we also don't believe that it's just a symbol, Something really happened when Jesus was baptized. The Spirit came down. A voice spoke. And I know those things don't happen in that grand uh, picture when, when, when you've been baptized. But we still believe that those things are happening in those moments. That God's doing something. That God is meeting us there in a really beautiful way. Now, when, when I talked about it's not magic uh, either, I want you to understand, this is why John critiqued the religious leaders, all right? Pharisees and Sadducees were coming out. If you read verse 7, he calls them snakes. You know, not a great PR move. But he's really, uh, you know, critiquing them. And he says this, right? He's basically saying the biological blood of Abraham is not going to save you. Listen, God's going to find children who want to follow Jesus anywhere and everywhere. If you don't want to, God wants you. But if you don't want to, he's going to leave you be. The Pharisees and Sadducees can't just get baptized and expect to be in. That's, that's the idea of the magic, right? It's not magic. You actually have, a, have, a, have to have a heart that believes in Jesus and wants to follow him. So John says, don't even bother if, if your heart's not there. Uh, but if there is this turning point uh, in your heart, there's a turning point in your heart, there'll be the turning towards God in baptism, and then what'll happen after that? Fruit. You'll see fruit. You'll see your life changed. You will tell others. Your life will begin to look different. Okay? So you see a little snapshot. There's a turning in the heart, there's a turning to God in baptism, and then you'll see fruit. All right? That's the process that unfolds here. Third, uh, I grew up like many of you, Connecting baptism with fear. And biblically, that still can make sense. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, right? Proverbs have taught us that when you come to God, there, there's going to be some fear. And that's okay. I remember the week before I was baptized, March 1993. I was at my grandmother's church and heard the preacher talk about a conversation he had with his son. His son said that he was ready to be baptized and follow Jesus, and the dad asked why. And listen to what the son said, because I remember this. I've written it down a few times, so it stuck with me. The son said, uh, because if Jesus came back today, so there's the day of judgment, okay? Jesus came back today, Jesus is going to make things right. So he sounds like the Malachi, the John stuff. He didn't think that he would be going to heaven, so if Jesus came back today, day of judgment, he would not be going to heaven, which means he thinks he would be going to hell, all right? There's some fear there. Now, the preacher was a gentle man, and he didn't share the story in a scary way, and I'm really thankful for that. I know some of you have probably been scared to death into the baptistry before. I would love to hear some of those stories. But I do remember that feeling of conviction and fear. And it was just like, yeah, if God is real and there really is a day of the Lord and Jesus is coming back and I, I've got to do something. I've got to do whatever God wants me to do. And I told my dad and the next Sunday I committed my life to Jesus in baptism. But here's the deal. Fear only gets us so far. That's why we need something stronger than fear. We might have a healthy fear of our parents early in life, might have an unhealthy fear. But we tend to grow out of that fear. Some of you may have grown up in a once saved, always saved culture. That's a kind of a 
what's the word I'm looking for? You, not in churches of Christ, but in other religious uh, Christian groups, you might have heard once saved, always saved, all right? But in churches of Christ, we have come to joke, because it wasn't funny at the time, uh, that we grew up in a once saved, barely saved culture, all right? Because that fear led us to believe that if we sinned, we messed up, that we were going to be lost again, that we wouldn't be saved. And as a, as a teen or a college student, you imagine a teenager and a college student who's, who's just found Jesus, trying to, trying to do right, still going to mess up plenty, right? You know, I could be going to heaven or hell about 20 times a day. That's a nightmare. That is a horrible way to live, right? That is not the way God wanted this to, to play out in our lives. But when we come to Jesus out of fear, we kind of get sucked into that. And we're like, oh, I messed up. Oh, okay, I better pray. I better hurry and pray. Sorry, God. Okay, I'm back in, right? That's why we've got to read some other verses that talk about you're not going <laughs> to fall out that easily, all right? But it's, why, it's how I grew up. But the big deal is we shouldn't be afraid of God for the rest of our lives. God doesn't want that. Your Father in heaven does not want that. That's why 1 John says, perfect love drives out fear. I want you to say that with me, all right? Perfect love drives out fear, all right? John's been trying to teach us that. So as you get to know the God, God the Father better through Jesus, his love is going to drive out that childlike fear that you started with. How are we going to drive out the fear? How are we going to drive out that kind of fear? Well, spoiler alert, I think it has something to do with Jesus' baptism, right? So I want to remind you that what we're doing in the, in the Bible is not just a history lesson, okay? We're not just learning, oh, that's nice that that happened 2,000 years ago. We believe that the Bible is living and active. Say that with me, living and active, okay? So we believe that even though I'm hearing this story from 2,000 years ago, I believe that God is trying to say something to me today from this story. So here's what I think God's trying to tell us. If you've been baptized... Can you go back and remember when it was and where it was and who it was that baptized you? You know what I wish that you and I had been told when we came up out of that water? The older gentleman that baptized me, Lynn Matheny, has gone on to be with the Lord. Now, I'm not faulting Lynn at all, just that this is what we grew up in. I wish when I'd come up out of the water that Lynn had said, Casey, I want you to know that your father says, you're my son, and I love you, and I'm pleased with you. Before you take a step out of this baptistry, I'm going to pick on Trace, since she's my wife for Mother's Day. Did your dad, did Rick baptize you? Yeah. That when, when Tracy came up out of the water, I assume Rick didn't do this just because of our tradition, I wish when Tracy had come up out of the water, her dad had said, your heavenly father wants you to know that you're my daughter and I love you and I'm proud of you. I wish I'd gotten that when I'd come up out of the water because I think that would have been a really good balance to the fear. And those two things, intention with the love and the fear, I think, I think I probably would have gotten off to a little better start. And God's taking care of me, and God's taking care of you. When Fred was here, if you remember Fred Ligon about a month ago, whenever that was, two months ago maybe now, he told a story about his son playing baseball, and he gave him these words before he played. You remember these phrases? If you heard him, he said, You have nothing to prove, nothing to lose, nothing to fear. That's what God is saying to us when we commit our lives to him in baptism. Can you imagine starting out this way? We might all need therapy now to go back and kind of talk through that if we didn't get that, all right? But go see a counselor, all right? Counselors are good. Um, that's what God is saying to us when we commit our lives to him in baptism. Before you Think about a teen or a college student. Before you ever graduate high school or college, you're already a child of God. 
nothing to fear. Before you get married, you are already completely loved by God. You don't need another person to complete you. And, and a good number of people, that's why we get into marriage, right? To, we need somebody to complete us. <laughs> Jerry Maguire did not have it right, okay, if you're a Jerry Maguire fan. Another human being can compliment you, but they do not complete you. God has already completed you when you come out of that water. You've already got all the love you need, if that's all you ever get. So you have nothing to fear and nothing to lose. And before you get that first job or promotion, think working with college students, you know, it's the internships and the first job and what all am I going to do with my life? Before you get the job or the promotion, God is proud of you. He's already pleased with you. You've already succeeded. So you have nothing to prove to anyone. And I hope you can see why we need the baptism of Jesus to balance out the baptism of John. I'm so thankful Trong and Matt, Matt are here this morning. Uh, when they were baptized, brothers, I messed up. I didn't say those words to y'all when you came up out of the water. I wish I had said those words to Trong and to Matt when they came up. But I want to remind them today, reminding Miles, I didn't say them to Miles when he came up out of the water. I'm still learning and I'm still growing. I'm still trying to figure out what God's word, how he wants me to, to minister. But I want you men and I want you ladies to hear that you if you have been baptized into Jesus, that you're a son and daughter, and that you're loved, and that God is pleased with you. I'm not going to make that mistake again, all right? You just better buckle up. The next person that wants me to baptize them, you know what I'm going to do when you come out of the water, all right? Spoiler alert. It's going to happen, because I'm so convinced that you need that to remember. And so if you've never been baptized, and you're ready to submit and commit to the journey like Jesus did, I want you to imagine God saying those words to you today. And if you want to talk more soon, then let's talk to Rex, talk to an elder, shepherd, talk to me, and let's talk more about that. I'm very excited that Trong is going to come up this morning, and he is going to transition us into our time of communion. So come on up, brother. We're going to use the yellow mic for Trong. Yeah, yeah, I'll stay here, man. So, good morning, church. How are everyone doing today? Um, maybe someone know me, someone know Dong, but um, yeah, I have been here in this century for in the past two years, and I was just like, just like a lot of family to me. I want to say thank you for BSC and Casey have uh, led me to get, get me back to God and get me uh, baptized uh, two years ago. And a lot of things going on in my life and whenever I'm in a lowest point, I usually just uh, talk to Casey. I, I text to him or I call him or we have a chit chat at the cafe surf together, read some words of Bible and yeah, pray in for each other. And yeah, we we console each other also. No, yeah. And I just want to invite Chris Reinhardt and Mike come up here with me also. Yeah, I remember like two or three weeks ago, Mr. Rest, our pastor, he said a story about uh, diversity in um, uh, among God, uh, God, uh, God people right now these days, and then that's a good thing about the uh, ministry. Yes, we. Before, like, just at the beginning, Christian just like God just created the Bible for Jew people. 
And then the 12 disciples, they stretch out God's words to the Gentile uh, along the Jordan River. And yes, but now after two, uh, 2022 years, now mostly like God's words stretch out among all kind of people, like, um, yes, why? African American, Asian, Latino. Yeah, that. we praise God for that. Amen. I mean, yes. God is good. And I want to say thank you and um, affirm about uh, Chris Reinhardt. He very quiet. He just yes, he very quiet, but he a good man and then he also my best friend here beside Casey and um Mike Newing, he's um he's from the same country with me also. Yes. We are from same city. Just different neighborhood a little bit, yeah, because Saigon is a very big city, just like New York City here in America. Yes. So yeah, we since I met Chris and my also through cases, through BSC, and then we become best friends. We hang in out a lot. Every Sunday after church, we just went out for lunch. We talk sometimes about our lives. Sometimes, yeah, but sometimes we say about the in the some the message from church and the, in the Bible also. And okay, so <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of things to say. But time time is our time is limited, and then just I. <laughs> Maybe I just wrap up or something and then say uh, we're going to read um, a verse in the Bible and then pray for the church, for the co- uh, communion here. And, oh, I, what is it? Okay, so Chris and Mike, you, you all want to preach a message with me and we are praying for the church. Sorry, it's not on the, on the slide. <laughs> for I know the plans I have for you, declare the Lord, the plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plan to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your, your heart. Jeremiah 29, 29 11 through 13. Amen. Okay, so um, you can close your eyes or you just like can pray with me. Like, our Father, our Father in heaven, um, it is a, an honor for me today to speak to the church, and then I'm, I'm coming to you to pray for our church to have a, a blessing with ahead, and uh, praying for whatever they have to enduring or the good thing or the bad thing in their life. Still, I know you're gonna show them a miracle in the ways out of the job world, and we are coming to you today to give in time and, and sharing your super in your holy name, Amen. Uh, elements here, and then in the two back tables. Please go and uh, serve yourself now. Thank you. The Savior alone carried the cross for all of my day. He paid the cost. Salvation complete. Now forever I'm free. Calvary covers it all. Calvary. 
Good morning again, church. Uh, just a quick announcement. We have been taking up the last two weeks uh, donations for Adora Hope Pregnancy Center, uh, and we're still taking up these donations. This money will go towards helping provide care for mothers who are expecting and, even, and on after they give birth to their baby to provide them ongoing support so that they can take care of their children in, in healthy ways. We're going to show a video about that, but uh, you'll see these uh, cards around. You can give uh, your donation by money, just cash, uh, obviously money, <laughs> but by cash, by check. You can also uh, make a donation through United Way if you need to know more about that. Get a hold of us at the church office and we can get that information for you. Here's a video. pregnancies or in caring for their babies. Many of the moms who come to our centers are parenting by themselves. Many of these women, who are often victims of abuse, neglect, and toxic influence, will succumb to lives of hardship and hopelessness. They need steady, positive influences and loving, caring support to heal and begin a healthy life for themselves and their babies. This is where a client advocate steps in to become a voice of hope and truth. The heart of our work at Adore of Hope is our HOPE program. This free mentoring program pairs clients with one of our trained client advocates who mentors and encourages them through the pregnancy and parenting experience. The HOPE program educates moms and dads to help them grow as parents, as people, and ultimately as followers of Christ. By completing lessons and meeting with an advocate, parents earn points that can be redeemed for items in our baby boutique. The HOPE program is about so much more than material needs, more than any item a parent takes home. The relationship that develops between a client advocate and a parent is invaluable, and it's what gives birth to hope and true transformation. Let's stand as we sing our closing song. Let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Let the blind say I can see. It's what the Lord has done in me. Let the weak say I'm strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Let the blind say I can see. It's what the Lord has done in me. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. Hosanna, Hosanna, to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna. Jesus died and rose again. Into the river I will wade. There my sins are washed away. From the heavens mercy 
stream of the Savior's love for me. I will rise from waters deep into the saving arms of God. I will sing salvation songs. Jesus Christ has set me free. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Lamb that was slain. Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. Hosanna, Hosanna to the Hosanna, Hosanna, Jesus died and rose again. Lord be thy name, thy kingdom come. Our debtors and lead us not to temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom the power and the glory forever and ever amen have a blessed day church